Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to first of the FIPCA talks this year. Um, tonight we have Owen McGillicoda talking about how to make sure you can avoid, how to avoid diseases amongst your bees and how to keep them healthy. So I'll just hand over to you on where you go. Yeah, I just had to share the screen. Uh, Brendan might just run it through. Oh, sorry. I'll just make sure it works. <laughs> Uh, sorry, how do I do this again? Do I? Um, you should have on the bottom of the screen, you should have share screen a little if you move the cursor uh, down. Uh, yeah, I'll share screen. Yeah. Yeah. And then you should. Um, and I just, I have my talk there. Yeah, click on that and that should pop share. up. Share. There we go. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying okay. that. I just put that on the yeah. slideshow. Yeah. All right. There you go. Is that okay, yeah? Yep, perfect. Oops. Right. So I go ahead? Yep, away you go. Uh, okay, folks. Uh, thanks, Brendan, for inviting me here. So this evening, what I want to talk about is basically um, disease prevention in your bees. I I'm not going to really touch on, say, the diagnosis of disease and treatments of disease and all that. I'm, I'm really talking about uh, prevention. Um, a lot of this is quite common sense. I just want to put it maybe in some kind of order. Um, and uh, you know, this is this is a really important topic these days because we want to, you know, we don't obviously don't want our bees uh, developing any disease. And you know, one advantage of that is that we won't be using any treatments less. We'd be using less treatments on our bees. Um, and you know, if you can use preventive measures, you, you are trying to help the bees to take care of themselves, more or less. Um, I'm a commercial beekeeper. Uh, sometimes, you know, if, when you're, uh, and honey production is my, is my biggest aim. Um, and sometimes that honey production gets a bad name because you seem to be, sometimes it's hinted that you're exploiting the bees. But as uh, I remember one American beekeeper said, only, only healthy bees will produce honey. And every year I take uh, records, uh, of my very detailed records of my bees. I record loads of different characteristics during the year. And at the end of the year, then I go through it. And I do this thing where I look at my best 10% 10, 10 best producer of honey and the 10% who are the worst. And there are certain factors that you'll find between those different cohorts of bees. The one that really stands out is that in the lowest 10% of bees that have shown some indication of some kind of disease, usually something like maybe chalk brood uh, or maybe uh, varroa uh, most commonly. And they were, that's the main, it's, you know, there's loads of other characteristics as well that would be different, but the, one of the biggest differences is, is the amount of disease in the ones that don't uh, produce any honey because they obviously they haven't thrived. Now, so when I talk about disease, um, I'm talking about really, I mean, and there's a, there are several diseases, but the one, really we all want to avoid the one that sends shivers down all beekeepers is of course American fowl brood. And so this is what you're really trying to do. Anything you're, you know, any cleanliness, hygiene uh, you're undertaking, it's really the aim of avoiding American fowl brood. Because if you avoid American fowl brood, then usually it will, avoid, it will help avoid any of the other um, diseases that are, that are there. Um, so um, what I want to go through, first of all, the thing about honeybees anyway have these the natural defense mechanisms that uh, help them, that they actually have a very good uh, immune system, both individually and as a colony that uh, has helped them thrive over the years. And, and they have to have a good immune system because if you think about you know, the large numbers, you know, whatever, 40,000 or so bees in a colony in the middle of summer, uh, it's a very crowded environment, so they need natural mechanisms to uh, prevent the spread of the disease amongst themselves. And the thing about these, uh, you know, when humans look after bees, then, you know, this might affect some of those natural mechanisms. Uh, one of the main things is colony dispersal. Um, Tom Seeley over in New York State has done a, a lot of work on the various defense mechanisms that uh, wild colonies, you know, um, unmanaged colonies have. And, and so colony dispersal is one of bees naturally, say in a natural environment like a forest, they will disperse themselves. I can't remember what the distance is. 
um, I think off the top of my head might be a kilometer, uh, but I could be wrong with that. But he's done work showing, you know, that um, colonies naturally disperse themselves. Uh, and this obviously avoids uh, drifting, whereas humans would keep uh, colonies in an apiary. They're quite close together. Um, in some countries, you know, they're traditionally really, really close together. Um, and this obviously through mechanisms like drifting and robbing helps spread uh, disease. Uh, in the wild, they also have a, you know, comb renewal is quite good, uh, you know, depending the size and the cavity, but they will often, you know, they will make new comb and then, you know, originally there probably was some kind of relationship between the honeybee and the wax moth, whereby like the wax moth was there to get rid of old comb and then, you know, uh, the bees would uh, continually build their own comb. Um, and that's one thing sometimes beekeepers can tend to leave the comb, stay in a colony a long time and uh, it gets very old. And obviously the older it gets and um, it, it becomes a kind of um, a sponge for uh, all kinds of uh, disease. And then and, and the, you know, there would be various other insanitary products would like you know, the from the, the mummies from the from the young larvae and or pupae and um, bits of food and everything accumulate in, in, in the in the comb. Uh, swarming is another uh, very important mechanism by which by whereby uh, you know feral colonies will control disease because when you have swarming you have a broodless period. Uh, where you know when the old queen leaves before the new queen starts laying, and this plays a very important renewal uh, uh, role in uh, controlling disease, and it's been shown uh, a lot of studies have shown that it plays a major role in varroa control. Um, whereas the beekeeper, of course, uh, is trying to prevent swarming. Um, uh, whereas you know it's swarming is a good thing. So I mean, I believe myself there's nothing wrong with controlling swarming, but if you have a colony. Uh, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't swarm, that, you know, um, maybe then you should artificially swarm it and, you know, um, so that you induce um, a broodless period in it. Uh, and uh, there's various hygienic behavior mechanisms in honeybees that help them um, control uh, disease. And this is, you know, this could be from removing uh, diseased larvae or pupae or um, grooming behavior, because all these are with varroa biting, um, varroa and all that, and they play an important role in, in uh, natural defense mechanisms as well. <coughs> Propolis is really important as well. A lot of work in recent times, especially again, Tom Seeley and other people working with looking at wild colonies have shown that basically the wild colony is surrounded by um, a kind of a cocoon of, of propolis, every surface is propolized and obviously that plays an important role. A lot of breeding over, over the last decades, for a long time, uh, has actually treated propolis very negatively. And you know, uh, breeders would give these that propolize a lot, they'd give us a negative score. Um, whereas, you know, it, I, I would actually work the other way. If, 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 they, if, con if colonies produce a lot of propolis, I would actually um, you know, mark them up and give them a good, good score. Our, our the native bee is very good at propolis, probably the second best of all the subspecies uh, at producing uh, propolis. So, um, and and the thing is, you know, in our um, very smooth walled hives, um, you know, propolis it might be hard for the bees to build up propolis, but the beekeeper can take measures, you know, to roughen the inside. Um, of the hive just to help the bees um, coat it with the propolis that they want to do it. This is one of the biggest differences between uh, honeybees in the wild and uh, managed honeybees is that, of course, there's no beekeeper there to spread disease from one colony to another. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that's uh, a major factor. And as well, of course, you have natural selection in the wild. So if you have a diseased colony, uh, it will naturally die out um, uh, because, you know, it's, it's uh, but beekeepers, uh, you know, if they're a weak colony that seems to be struggling, they will um, uh, cause it, or, you know, cause it along, try and keep going. Just it seems to be a natural human reaction. Beekeepers don't like losing a colony, but sometimes it's 
should be might be a good thing to um, you know get rid of those that are not thriving or have some problem, continuous problem. So I'll just go through what I want to talk about specifically tonight, um, and it's going to cover. It's basically this is apiary hygiene. I suppose this topic is really called, and I'm going to look at some aspects of it. Some aspects maybe I'll just touch upon. It's it's a huge area, and you know there's probably bits that I'm probably leaving out, um, but um, and, and so. I want to just talk maybe about what are the roots of disease transmission in in uh, bees, um, and uh, you know uh, how we can intercept those roots. Uh, just various principles, um, you know, of the whole thing of apiary, which will become self-explanatory when I go through it. I want to talk briefly, just briefly, on say something like the ape, how the uh, an apiary should be laid out to help in um you know uh, controlling disease uh, and then i think this is very important the you know the hygiene that the hygiene uh, protocols that the beekeeper undertakes during their routine inspections i think is very important as well uh i'll talk about comb replacement uh quarantine practices you know uh how you can use kind of uh, methods of isolating different pieces of equipment from each other to prevent the spread of disease. Dealing with swarms uh, from unknown sources. And, and I'll touch a bit as well on breeding for disease resistance, which there's a lot of this going on at the moment, especially with Varroa, um, because uh, you know, there is a genetic component to uh, disease resistance. Um, and so bees can be bred for that. You know? And then I want to talk uh, basically about how you go about cleaning and sterilizing your equipment. Uh, you know, and you know, there's a lot of information on this, but sometimes it seems to be a bit spread out a bit. Um, and I just want to bring it all together. So, okay, that's it. So, um, sorry, did I just? Uh, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Right, principles. Of, so, apiary hygiene. Right. So, just want to talk about these are some just basic principles. Just a few of them. Um, so, basically, as a beekeeper, hygiene should become part of your everyday routine. Uh, you know, it should be anytime you approach your hives. You know, it should be something. Not necessarily. You know, it shouldn't take. You shouldn't become obsessed with it, but it should become part of your routine. Um, but one thing, you know, to really uh, keep in mind always is that, as I said before, honeybees have a, their natural defense mechanisms against disease. So one of the best ways of preventing disease is by boosting their uh, natural immune response, especially by, uh, say, reducing stress. So this would be like things like make sure they always have food, um, making sure that you don't leave the hive open too long, uh, that you don't that you open it under right conditions. And that you don't open it too often. This is often um, a problem with beginners who are very enthusiastic, obviously, because it is a fascinating uh, area. The beekeeping is a fascinating craft, and sometimes they actually spend too long or too often uh, visiting their hives, and it kind of can put a bit of stress on the bees. And if colony is open under, say, cool conditions for long times, uh, you know that can cause stress. Um, so there's a lot of of our, the diseases that bees have that seem to be there in uh, you know uh, subclinical levels and they're not symptomatic um, so long as the bees are not under stress. But when they are under stress, then say something like chalk brood and to, they say to a certain extent as well in European fowl brood that if the bees under stress, under stress, the disease becomes uh, even though it might be there. Um, in some clinical subclinical levels, it doesn't become expressed or symptomatic until the colony is under stress. And this is the same, obviously, probably I think with uh, nosema and acarine as well. To a certain extent, their stress uh, it would cause them to be um, become um, expressed. Uh, this is as well, <clears throat> uh, you know, keeping your uh, equipment clean. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to sterilize everything, and you know, there's a difference between cleaning and sterilizing. Uh, but if you have a clean surface, like a clean hive tool, uh, an infectious agent won't cling to it, even though you mightn't be sterilizing the, the 
the hive tool, um, you are cleaning it, and that would, you know, the infectious agents wouldn't be able to, to stick to it. It's very important that, you know, any procedures that you use for hygiene, especially routine ones, they must be easy to implement. And there must, you know, there's no point to you to go into the apiary and spending, you know, whatever, 15, 20 minutes, uh, you know, um, cleaning things or making sure everything is um, sterile. Uh, if, you know, you need a procedure that is easy to use um, and, uh, and easy to remember. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, it will become, uh, when, when the beekeeper is under pressure, then they will too easily put aside any of these uh, procedures that they hope to implement. And you need to be disciplined. Whatever, if you decide to do certain things like cleaning, say, you know, cleaning your hive tool between um, and washing your hands or gloves between hives, then stick to that. You know, this is make it sure that it's part because, you know, don't do it half the time and then do it sometime. You know, if it's part of your protocol, such as, you know, writing up your records, uh, then make sure you, you do it. Uh, and then if you are in a scenario, um, you know, and you, you do come across a case of disease, then, you know, any, um, say, protocols you have for preventing disease obviously will have to be stepped up a couple of levels uh, just to make sure that that disease does not spread any further to any other hives in the, in, in the apiary or if you're more than one apiary from that apiary to another apiary. So this is just a diagram about the different routes of transmission. Um, uh, Brendan's recording this anyway, so any of these um, slides that you need to look at in more detail, or you, know, you can uh, go back uh, and look at them. Uh, so there's different you know, transmission routes. So like you, know, you have your brood combs, so you can, you, know, you can have disease uh, being transmitted from the brood combs <clears throat> to, the, to the adult bees. Uh, who are on the combs, and then um, you know the beekeepers handling the brood combs, they can uh, pick up anything from that. Uh, if brood combs are moved to other colonies, they can carry whatever any disease that's on them. And if they're obviously moved to other apiaries, they can also bring anything disease with them. Uh, you know, there's so the larvae are in the brood combs, so you know any disease in the larvae will be transmitted to the brood combs. And you know any adult bees feeding the larvae will pick up the, the brood combs from that. Uh, most of this is quite obvious, and I, I won't labour the you know, point. But there is all these um, routes uh, of, of transmitting disease, and you know it's up to the beekeeper to try and make sure as much as possible that you know these uh, routes of transmission are interrupted, uh, you know, or, or that at least to be aware of them, you know, and that when you're handling. Uh, you know, brood combs be aware that you know that, that you can be transmitting disease from you know the combs to your gloves um, and then on to another colony. Uh, these, this is a just you know a, a rough. This is and it's not probably not complete, but it gives you a rough idea of some diseases that can be transmitted um, uh, between. So, like for example, like uh, adult bees can transmit AFB and AFB uh, to uh, pick it up from larvae and pass it on, you know, and uh, Varroa can obviously travel in adult bees. The Nozema can be passed from adult bees. And uh, in the brood, of course, AFB and EFB, um, and obviously Varroa is in the brood. And, you know, it's the same brood combs. Uh, you can have, even if there's no brood in, in them, you can have, a, especially AFB can continue in there for uh, decades, um, and that can be transmitted on. In the super combs, you know, you, uh, you could have um, uh, you know AFB possibly uh, hanging on in the combs, and in honey, uh, AFB can be uh, readily transmitted through honey as well. And um, so this just gives you a, a general idea of you know the, the different diseases out there that can be transmitted through these different components in the whole colony. So I just want to touch briefly on apiary layout because I think it's just a good place to start. And um, basically, you know, one of the most important things is that if you're setting up an apiary, you want to ensure that there's plenty of forage present um, for the bees. The bees need food, obviously, uh, and especially pollen. So there needs to be a source of pollen. 
And, um, you know, it's important that you don't have too many colonies there. Now, I'm often asked how many is too many, and it's, it's, this is a, you know, how long is a piece of string, because it depends on the area. So you have some areas, you know, that have very little intensive farming and have loads of hedgerows and, you know, um, old, uh, small fields and, you know, plenty of trees. You know, you could put any even apiary there, you could put plenty of hives in that. Uh, whereas in another area which is probably set in uh, your know, tillage area where there isn't as much, there might be a bit of oil seed rape and not much else, you have to be more careful. You also have to be aware of other beekeepers around you and how many hives they are. Um, I think, you know, um, in Ireland, we have actually very low stocking rate anyway. We were the, probably the lowest in Europe. I think on average, it works out at about 0 0.5 colonies per square kilometre, which is very low, I think, in in Switzerland, it's something like eight colonies per square kilometer, and the uh, Czech Republic is about 10 colonies per square kilometer. So, you know, uh, we don't in general, but there might be just little areas that there is a lot of bees in, so you just have to be aware. Um, how many colonies to put in Napery? I, I generally work uh, about eight, uh, eight to 12, um, and just depend, and I think, you know, I generally keep an eye on that and if I find that you know that they don't seem to be yielding as well as I think I just uh, decreased the number and then other ones seem to be able to take much more uh, but that's just uh, you know you just have to that's just experience uh, you know this is quite you know its site should be sheltered uh, you know um, uh, from wind um, because you know uh, Bees are quite good at dealing, especially during the winter, you know, bees are very quite good at dealing with the cold. If they have enough food, they'll deal with cold. But I've often found that wind is the problem, you know, so, you know, you should have, if there's no shelter in the, in the site, then you should introduce it. Uh, and obviously drifting, you know, so you don't put your colonies in a big, long, straight line uh, because, you know, that will, that will uh, just uh, promote drifting. Now, there's, there's a lot of drifting goes on anyway. Bees will go from one hive to another, quite, quite a large percentage of bees seemingly move from one colony to another, whether deliberately or accidentally. Um, so you should, uh, you know, but if you have your colony set up in a kind of a non-linear format, that, that would minimize uh, the drifting. You know, you should try and keep the surface level. It's important, you know, that you have a good area to work with because, um, you know, it, it, one of the things, when the beekeeper is working with bees, that the beekeeper has to be comfortable too, because if the beekeeper is under stress, definitely it can put the bees under stress as well. Um, so, you know, you should try and keep the surface um, as, as fairly free of undergrowth as possible. Um, even though, I mean, I think, you know, actually some research shows that when, well, when the Asian hornet arrives here, actually undergrowth, having undergrowth growing up, a lot of foliage growing in front of the hive is supposed to actually work, play um, you know, a small role in deterring um, hornets from entering colonies. Uh, but you should have a good work area behind the, the, the hive where you can put your equipment down nice and you know, carefully and uh, you won't be falling over things. Uh, yeah, and so plenty of room for, for doing your manipulations and laying out um, your equipment. Um, so now I'm going to contradict myself, and this is one of my apries. So, you know, this is so, I mean, you know, there's plenty of undergrowth here. And generally I try at the start of the year, I try and, uh, you know, um, uh, what's the word, stream the whole area and, you know, try and make it a little bit better. But then as the season goes on, uh, so I don't really, you know, follow my own, and some apries now are better than others. Uh, much easier to control the undergrowth. Um, what I do have them kind of laid out, they're laid out, I generally lay them out in um, blocks of six, which are, are eight possibly, but often six uh, with all the entrances facing kind of uh, uh, in opposite directions. So, you know, uh, you have on your left hand side, you have two colonies and their, their entrances are facing to the left and the ones in front of us there, their entrances are facing uh, out uh, ahead of us. And there's behind us, there's another two. So this creates an area at the back. Now, you know, these are actually quite close together, but often, you know, 
I, this is a landowner who gave me some land and uh, you know, uh, ideally I, I would like to spread this over maybe a hundred yards, but obviously he's not going to, uh, wouldn't be too, too happy with me taking over more of his, it's, you know, a working farm and uh, you know, I'm just happy to get that little space that I can. Uh, this is another, this is, um, I think this is John Somerville's apiary. So here they're a bit more spread apart. And, you know, if you have the space, uh, you know, do. I mean, the one thing is you can't spread them too far apart because then you have to be carrying equipment from one to the other. Uh, so, you know, for just for convenience. But, you know, try and you, you will have to compromise somehow, but, you know, try and spread them out as much as you can. Now, this is this to me is really important and something you know, that I have really embarked on years ago, 20 years ago or more. Um, I was um, a well-known beekeeper. Uh, who I remember once he, when he was starting out, he, he got, uh, he lost mostly, I think all of his highs from American fowl brood. And uh, he said it nearly destroyed him, but he kept going and he said it made him a better beekeeper. And this is the most important thing to remember, like don't be ashamed of disease. If you do suffer disease, um, you know, and it's generally, not your fault and uh the thing is to learn from it and he, he this is what he did and this the same thing happened to me um about um oh, about 17 years ago uh i discovered european fowl brood in uh one apiary and at that time uh it created quite a lot of interest because european fowl brood hadn't really been seen in ireland for oh i think maybe 50 years um and uh i, I had a the, the dubious honor of rediscovering it. Uh, it probably was, I mean, there has been outbreaks of European fowl brood in, in uh, different parts in, I think in Switzerland and Sweden and Scotland, I think. And it's been generally think that it might be linked to um, Baroa, you know, with, with uh, the mites uh, biting, um, uh, you know, biting the larvae, it can, you know, it could, in some cases, what you might get is that the contents of the gut leaks out and that it seemingly, um, you know, makes subclinical levels of EFB, it just makes it more uh, transmissible. But, but my point being is that when I uh, got EFB, I re decided there and then to kind of embark on hygienic measures, just so obviously that I would um, prevent any spread. And, and, it, and it's over the long term, it worked, it took a while, but um, I still get a case occasionally, but it, Every second year, you get one or two cases of EFB. Um, and it's hard to know. It's a, it's a strange disease anyway. And I think there's probably a lot more of it around. It's just quite hard to detect. But anyway, so you know, in my routine inspections, I, um, you know, I, I really emphasize the whole uh, thing about uh, hygiene. So I would always disinfect my hive tool, gloves, and smoker between colonies before the inspection. So, um that would involve so uh i would have uh basically a bucket a sealable bucket uh, containing um washing soda and in that i would have my hive tool i would throw in a few hive tools into that and leave them soaked so you're finished your uh, your inspection you go and you throw in your hive tool you pick up another one i have a scrubber in there and i scrub my gloves and um, the hive tool and uh, I have a towel there and dry them and I give the smoker a quick um, wash as well. This takes about 15, 20 seconds. Um, and then, you know, what you do is, you know, you're finished your, your um, colony inspection, you go and smoke the next uh, colony, then you do your hygiene uh, and then you write up your record for the previous one. Um, so then you're going into the next hive with um, uh, with clean hive tool, clean gloves, and, and uh, wash smoker. Um, now I used to I used to uh, use uh, go barehanded when I examine my bees, but when you're putting your hands into washing soda, even the washing soda is quite mild. It is a still a basic chemical, um, so you know it can over a long time it can actually uh, you know damage your skin. So I started wearing um, just the nitrile gloves, the milking, uh, milking gloves, uh, which are very, won't stop stings or anything, but they was very easy, extremely easy to clean and if they get too grubby or just take them off and replace them. Um, so this, yeah, so here, this is, this is actually Megan Seymour, who's uh, 
uh, well-known uh, you know, advocates of um, disease prevention measures. And no, this is, she has her bucket there uh, of washing soda and uh, this is for, you know, after a hive and then she's just after washing up. So as well, you have a bucket, some kind of container with a, with a lid on it. So into this, you would put all your brace comb, scrapings, anything, green cells, anything like that. Uh, and mix, you know, never throw anything in the ground. Um, and, you know, it just prevents, well, it prevents robbing anyway. And robbing is a major factor in uh, disease transmission. But it also, you know, if you've, uh, bits of uh, scrapings of brace comb will often contain brood uh, in it and you know that brood can contain uh, disease. So you just put it all into a sealed container and then you can take it home. You can, you know, there'd be probably a certain amount of wax in it. You could just wash it and, and melt it. And you probably, at the end of the season, you probably have to recover some wax out of it. Uh, you know, so, you know, you take me measures to avoid robbing. So this would be say, don't keep your colony open too long. When you take your supers off, uh, the, off the hive to go into the brood box, make sure that you know that they're that they're covered um, and that they're not open to the air too, because especially in a weak colony, uh, you know, surrounded by a couple other strong colonies, robbing, uh, especially certain times of the year, say during the June gap or maybe um, after the honey flow has ended, robbing can start very very quickly. And if you do come across, uh, well, I, I, you should anyway, um, if you come across anything suspicious, then, you know, you should send it off. We have a very good bee diagnostic service. It's free. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, and the results are usually come back very quickly. Um, the one thing these days with modern technology, modern, um, uh, modern mobile phones, you can take photographs of anything suspicious as well and send it to somebody, uh, somebody with a bit more experience than you. Um, so it's always important to kind of take notice of anything in the colony that looks a bit suspicious. Yeah, so you would always record in your, you should have a hive record and you should have in the hive record should be a column for disease, if, especially the best one to use is Hooper's five questions and that and that um, disease is specifically recorded. So anything, anything that looks out of the ordinary, um, and it mightn't be anything serious. So you might see, especially to start here, you might see a bit of chalk brood, and I would always record that. So I would actually record chalk brood as either slight, medium, or severe, and uh, I would record that in, in my column. And the thing is, then it mightn't be a problem. So, but you know, the next time you go there, you can say you're back in for your next inspection. And if the chalk brood, chalk brood at this stage might have disappeared, so you know, oh, that's fine. The bees were able to handle it. It was only a temporary problem. Or else, you know, if it has got worse, or, you know, and you can see over the season in um, some colonies, you know, if they have problems with chalk brood, it disappears very quickly. And some, it seems to linger on for a good while. Uh, Varro is the, you know, of course, the major issue these days. So, I mean, and a lot of people are talking about, you know, uh, treatment-free uh, management of Varroa, and that's that's fair enough. But I mean, it's really important before you do that that you have an idea of what the Varroa load is in your colony. Um, so it's important to have an idea of this all the time. You know, there's no point if your colonies are heavily infested with Varroa and you try and decide. To, just on the spur of the moment to start stop treating them, uh, then you know it's quite possible that they will um, you know they will uh, succumb very quickly. So I mean, there's no point unless you have an idea. You don't know how successful your treatments are really either unless you have an idea. Uh, I mean, like you have this say the um, the screen under the mesh floor. Uh, it, it's not hugely accurate, but it gives you a you know a rough indication if you can you know clean it. You could do it actually this time of year now. You could actually clean your 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 um, the, the insert under the floor and then come back in whatever seven days, ten days, count the number of mites and it gives you the number of mites that have fallen per day, um, and that'll give you you know a rough indication of your flow load. You can also uh, you know use uh, an uncapping fork to look at the um, the drone um, drone pupae. Uh, and that will give you, you know, an indication too. 
or you know you can do the sugar shake is quite accurate it's probably uh, th the most accurate method that doesn't destroy the bees uh, as such um and you know if you do that once or twice a year it's a good idea it'll give you a quite accurate um, figure and even if you do it say after you've taken off the honey and before you treat you might find that there's a lot of colonies that you don't need to treat because you know there's no point treating something that when there isn't a problem if you're if they if colonies have practically no varroa um then there's no point treating them uh you know so it's it's it's, um, it's good good to do it once or twice a year uh, so when you're coming up to your first inspections, which could could be quite soon if this um, this kind of mild weather continues, uh, you know, and you come across often you'd come across dead colonies, and you know, someone will have no bees, some will have dead bees in them. Uh, well, the first thing you do is block it up. Even if you don't, if you're not able to take it home straight away, block it up because you don't want to um, leave it there because it'll get rubbed out. Um, so and then try and figure out why it has died. In my experience, generally, you know, any colony that succumbs um, to over the winter, generally it has been, it's, it's usually queen failure is one, one of the biggest, you know. So, uh, and this can happen, you know, especially say if you've, uh, like last year, where we had a good, very good autumn and you had late supersedure and queens didn't uh, mate properly. Or if you had a bad summer and queens didn't, didn't mate and properly and became infertile over, over the winter. Um, you know, and but you know, try and get an idea of why why the colony um, uh, succumbed, um, and you know, it, it depends. You know, sometimes there's unlikely to be brood in it, um, and generally, in this case, it's rarely a good idea to send away a sample because it's usually by the time you get to it, there's probably a certain amount of um, decay has gone on. Uh, but try and work out, you know, to see that it isn't maybe due to the disease. Uh, you know, when you use a uh, treatment, you know, obviously, and you have to, this is under Department of Health, the Department of Agricultural Regulations, you have to keep uh, a record of your disease treatment, so this is really important uh, to do. Um, and this is one thing that I, you know, um, which I'm a bit of a bugbear with me, is that when you take, when you take your supers off your, um, of your colony. Uh, it's really important to treat them as, well, first of all, and I'm not going, you know, I'm not talking tonight anything to do with health and safety or food safety issues, but you have to treat them as food containers. So like, make sure you put them on a clean surface, uh, basically your upturned roof. And then I would put something on top. So if you take off, say, if you have two or three supers, there's actually a lot of bees in there uh, usually. And so even the idea of you put the crown board back on top, uh, it will isolate, isolate those bees and it won't be causing hindrance, but also means that any bee robbing bees will be much harder for them to uh, get in. Um, just keep, you know, just keep some um, isolated. Food, you know, and this is the old classic question, when do you feed bees? Well, you feed bees when they need to be fed. Uh, so you should always, again, you, in the Hooper's five questions, there's one of the questions is, does the colony have sufficient food to the next visit? So this is really important. Uh, so because, you know, when the bees, especially a strong colony, if it runs out of food, it's placed under a lot of stress. Um, and as I said before, um, you know, this, this can hinder the colony's uh, Im immune response. So always make sure and assess that there's enough food there and, and pollen as well. Generally, we, in my experience anyway, uh, we rarely have problems with pollen in this country, um, but you know if you're in an area where you think you know you can always it's very easy to get uh, the pollen pollen supplements in that um, if you're if you're worried. And this is yeah you know this might sound obvious, but if you started beekeeping like you know far, 40, 30 years ago, it almost seemed um, uh, a mark of you know. Uh, how good a beekeeper or how dirty your bee suit was because I mean, I've even recently looked at old photos from 25 years ago of uh, beekeepers lined up at a, at a meeting and it's, uh, you know, you would barely know that, that initially all their uh, bee suits were uh, white at one stage. Uh, I mean, a bee suit is very easy to clean, you know, uh, the modern ones are very easy to clean and, you know, and they're quite good value these days. 
you know, even if you could afford to have two of them on the go and have, you know, use one, it depends how many colonies you have, of course, and how much beekeeping you're actually doing. But if you're spending a lot of time with bees, then you should, uh, you know, um, regularly replace your bee suit and, you know, um, wash them. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, it, it's important, you know, it's because, you know, uh, the grubbier your bee suit gets, the more likely it is to uh, harbor, you know, uh, um, disease and not necessarily disease, probably unhygienic uh, and insanitary, you know, uh, compounds. And that. Uh, no, I just threw this up. Like uh, this is just um, guys looking at uh, colonies here. Like, and you know, they have placed. They've obviously it's a double brood box, and they've taken one brood box off and they've put it on top of what looks like a spare, um, a spare empty brood box. Um, and that's fair enough, it's only isolated, but I would close that up as well. I would put something, just, I would have put the crown board on top, uh, or uh, I can't see, uh, yeah, there is a kind of a bit of a roof there, or you could put that on the roof and put the crown board on top, just to maybe isolate it, you know, while you're doing the, the your procedure. Uh, it's very important, you know, you don't know there's anything wrong with your uh, disease, sorry, with your brood until you know what healthy brood looks like. So tr try and familiar, familiarize yourself um, with what healthy brood looks like. And then, you know, um, if you see anything suspicious, then you know. And as again, you know, take a photograph. If you see something you're not, if you think the brood pattern is a bit off, take a photograph of it and get a second opinion. And as well as that, there's great aids now online and different, uh, there's different kind of little booklets and things that tell you what um, healthy brood looks like and what uh, brood affected by different diseases uh, look like. Um, I'll come back now. So this is another bugbear of mine. You know, it's really important, you know, uh, try not to uh, crush bees during, you know, when you're manipulating uh, colonies. It can, quite be, it can be quite difficult at times if you say a lot of heavy supers on a hive, but just try and make the effort uh, to do it. Uh, I mean, there's several reasons for this. Well, first of all, when you crush bees, it, release, it releases the alarm pheromone, and if the colony is slightly, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, tetchy, it will drive them a bit more so. But it also just, you know, if there's any um, disease within the bodies of those bees, it's going to be released. Something like nosema will be released into the, you know, uh, into the hive, and it, it's just, you know. It's, I think it's really important when you're working with bees to, to give them the respect of trying to um, be as gentle as possible with them. Uh, and all, if you have colonies that are weak, you know, and, this, and you go into your first inspections and there's always a few colonies that are slow to get going. And that's fair enough. And, there's, you, and it could be numerous different reasons for it. Uh, and you will help them along. And you know, most of the time, nearly always, they will soon get back on track. Um, and But if there's ones that are not prospering, that are not coming along, then you should have a good look at them and see why. It could be just a queen problem. The queen is failing, might be an old queen or a queen that hasn't mated properly or for some other reason. And she is just uh, you know, on her way out. But just make sure that it isn't anything to do with some disease problem. Um, and, you know, it is important that if your you know, honey can be um, a source of infection. So if you're taking honey from one colony, just be very careful about feeding it to another colony. Uh, and, and this is a part. That, so you're talking about, say, maybe, for example, um, frames of honey from a strong colony that can afford them and you want to give it to a colony that needs a bit of food. And in principle, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'll cover this in a bit more detail in a while. But uh, it's important that you check, you know, that you check the, the frame you're moving. Um, and also that you're obviously not taking a frame of honey from a colony that uh, looks suspicious, uh, has some kind of suspicious problem with it, and moving it to another. Uh, this is just to show, like, you know, what you would expect. This is a, a nice frame of brood, a good frame brood pattern, very few empty cells uh, there, um, you know, em empty, uh, sorry, I mean, I know, empty cells in the, in the wrong place. Um, so that's a, that's a good pattern, you know. 
where something like that would raise suspicions, you know, because it's not, there is, you know, it's very hard to see. If you look closely, there probably is a bit of a pattern, but, uh, you know, there's an awful lot. This is your classic pepper pot appearance where you have the, these little holes uh, or gaps. They're not, you know, they're basically what's happened is something has happened with the larvae in there and they've been removed and the queen has relayed them. Um, now, in this case, I think there was just a queen problem. Um, but, uh, it, but you know, you would treat that with suspicion until you've identified what the cause is. This one is definitely caused by disease. This is from European fowl brood, and you can see this pepper pot pattern again. So always be suspicious, you know, have a look. And um, I would always, you know, when you do get into a bit of breeding, uh, there's a few characteristics, especially if you, there's um, a kind of a template used by the Galtee Bee Breeding Group. And one of the things you evaluate for as each inspection is the brood pattern. And you give it, uh, you know, a marking between, you know, one and five. Um, and, you know, if, if a colony is getting very low scores, you'd want to have a good look at it to make sure that, uh, you know, that it, is, is, isn't, that it isn't disease. Uh, so, right, um, comb replacement, and this is very important, you know, you need to replace your brood combs regularly, the, the, you know, uh, in the old days, I remember in the old days, it, was, it seems like beekeepers didn't replace combs at all, because sometimes the combs uh, seem to last there and be so black as, you know, and thick, um, but today, like, it has become part of modern beekeeping that you, you know, really need that the brood combs can be a vehicle for disease. Um, and it's important that you replace them regularly. So how often? Well, when I, when I, about 20 years ago, it kind of was said two or three frames a year, and then that went to up to about maybe three or four and more. Um, and it's, you know, ideally you should replace as many as you can every year, you know, and this is personal choice. And I know in some countries they would uh, have systems where they replace all of them every year. It's a lot of work, especially at the beginning. You know, once you get into it, uh, it's easy enough. You know, once you've established a kind of a cycle of replacement. But I mean, I think you should be replacing any of them that looks, uh, you know, that, that that are old. And a lot of beekeepers put their number, the, the year, on the on the frame um, when they make them up, and this will give you an indicator of how old the the the, fr the frame, and how long it's been in use. Uh, you know, it, it also depends how much brood has been reared in those frames. Um, and you can do this in the springtime. You can take out your three, three or four frames. Or no, I mean, I wouldn't even give a number. I would say take out any as many old frames as you can and replace them. But you can also do it in the autumn time. Uh, say after, you know, you know, at the... Um, from July onwards, like or from beginning of July onwards, the queen's cutting down her laying and there's probably more empty frames there. And so you could take off um, frames then and put in new frames before you feed. Uh, when you're there and you go into, and, and there is research showing that when the queen is laying um, her eggs, she would actually, she actually prefers old comb, laying old comb. It's probably to do with the, the smells on it. Uh, even though the old combs might ne not necessarily be the healthiest for her to lay in, she actually prefers to lay there. Um, but what you can do is if there is cold combs there with a lot of brood on them, just move them to the edge of the nest, not the edge of the box now, but the edge of the brood nest. And then when you're coming the next time, move them out again so that they're on the outside of the brood nest. And then when the uh, nest begins to contract at the end of the summer, uh, you know, the the brood will be, there'll be no more brood in that and be easier to, to remove them. Uh, you can replace all the frames. If they're particularly bad, you can replace them all in one go um, using the Bailey frame exchange uh, or the, the Shook Swarm method. Uh, and this is a good idea. You know, if you're, uh, if say, maybe if you've inherited a few colonies from somebody um, that, you know, that have old combs in them, or say that you know Connie's been like neglected for a while and you want to replace them all in one go. And it works really well. I, I won't go into uh, sorry. Uh, and also it's, it's important that you replace your super frames regularly as well. Um, that they, you know, they, they should be um, you know, because they even though there's not as much contact with 
possible disease than the brood frames, it's important that they're fresh as well. Uh, sorry, so just, you know, just to show what I mean by old. Now, this is really, really, really old, ridiculously old, this one. Um, uh, whereas this one, this one has probably had only, you know, maybe one or two cycles of brood in it. Uh, so, you know, the one on the left is one that should have been uh, long gone from, from the hive. Um, I know a certain beekeeper who replaces East, uh, I'm not sure if he's, uh, maybe he still does it. Uh, when he was going through the spring and he was taking out the old brood combs, the first thing he did is drive his fist through the brood combs to make sure that he didn't reuse them again. Because if you were there and you have a box of old combs in your shed or your garage that you've taken out of the colony and then it comes to the, the summer and you have a swarm or you need to do an artificial swarm and you're looking for uh, frames and you see this box of old combs here, the temptation is to use them again. So it's a good idea to destroy them as soon as possible. Uh, I won't go into detail of the Bailey frame ex exchange. I've done it quite often and it works really, really well. Um, it's, it's a great way of, uh, and you can do it fairly soon in the season in a strong colony. Um, and it's a great way of uh, replacing all the combs in one go. And it's basically what you do is you just put a new box of foundation, brood box foundation, top of your old, your old one, um, and you feed it. So the bees will draw that out and they'll move that up. And then you just move the queen up there. Um, and then you can introduce a new entrance. And basically all the brood will hatch out in the box down below. Uh, and they will actually even often move stores from the, the box on, uh, down below, and then you take away the empty, empty one. I won't go into in detail, there's loads of information on, on the internet about uh, doing this, but uh, it, might, it works really well um, to replace all the combs in one go. You know, if, if I could, I, I would do it more often. It, it, it is a little bit time consuming, it depends how many number of hives you have. Uh, the the Shook Swarm is also a really good way of doing it. It's a bit more severe, uh, because you lose the brood. But sometimes, you know, if you're just maybe the brood, if they're, um, if, if the frames are very old and you're just a little worried um, and you, and this is a really quick way of doing it. Um, and it works very well as well. Um, and, um, but as I said, the, the main drawback is that you are uh, sacrificing some brood. But if you do it earlier, reasonably early in the year, it isn't that much. And, and the bees recover very quickly. So um, it's basically what all you do is you put in um, your new brood box uh, with all new frames, um, and then you just shake all the bees into that. Um, and uh, yeah, shake all the bees into it. Uh, and give, give it a good feed. Um, and that recovers uh, really quickly. That is, it, it does act like a swarm. Um, and you know, the way swarms really respond well to new wax and then they build wax very quickly. And uh, anytime I've had to use it, it's a standard treatment when you have European fowl brood. And I found you know, that it, works really well and the bees recover very, very quickly. So quarantine practices, these are, um, it's, what I mean by this is basically um, isolating the parts of one colony from parts of another colony to, um, you know, to prevent uh, transfer of disease. Now this is quite difficult in practice, but you can come up with various methods yourself. Um, so the one thing you always be, say brood combs, and it's a standard thing, you know, you transfer brood combs between one colony and another. If you're there and your colony is, um, appears to be queenless, a uh, standard method of testing for that is a test frame, which involves taking a frame of uh, young, uh, young larvae from one colony and put it into the one that might be queenless and seeing if they raise queen cells. So you're actually transferring brood from one colony to another, but it's a standard part of beekeeping practice. So the thing is just be cautious about it and make sure you give a good look at the colony uh, that donates, that is donating the, the brood comb. 
before you transfer across. I mean, if there's any, you know, chalk brood on it, uh, I wouldn't do it. Or if there's any suspicious, the brood looks a bit suspicious, I, I would be very careful. So then you're moving brood combs between apiaries and this, you know, this uh, can happen, you know, if, uh, as well. Uh, and even, you know, moving colonies between apiaries here, nukes between apiaries. Again, just be sure that there's no problem with disease in the nuke or on the brood frames and nuke or uh, colony that you're moving in. Uh, and it's the same, yeah, as I said. Now, this is obviously, if you're, if you're in a, a situation where disease has happened recently, then you would, uh, this is when I said before, you would move up your level um, of um, procedure. Uh, and you wouldn't, you definitely wouldn't be moving bees around the place, you know, uh, because it's just be too uh, risky. Um, but if, if you're not in that case where there hasn't been any apparent disease, then just be very careful, uh, but it should be possible. Now, this is one that's quite difficult to put in practice, but say, and this is what you, you kind of uh, mentioned a lot uh, for in food safety, that you're supposed to have dedicate specific supers to specific hives. Now, this is very difficult to put in practice because if you know in one year, you have a colony and it might need three supers this year and it might need five supers the next year, whereas the colony beside it might be the other way around. And so we have these extra supers. Um, and as well as I've pointed out before as well, the important thing in here is probably not the supers, but the frames within the supers. So if you're doing this, then shouldn't you not also be um, dedicating each frame in each super should be dedicated to that particular hive. Now, if you have a small number of hives, this, you can probably do this to um, a certain extent, but at least it's a good idea to even um, dedicate the supers to a particular apiary if you have more than one apiary. Um, and um, I know I know one beekeeper in England and in a teaching apiary, and what they do is, which I think is a very good idea, is what I can't remember, they've probably got maybe 16 hives in their teaching apiary, and they split it into groups of four. So basically, each four is a unit and you're allowed to uh, move, say, brew combs between each of those four highs in the unit and supers, they, all those four, you can use the same supers on them. But you can't move, use those supers or frames into another unit. Uh, and, you know, that, that is probably a quite a good idea, uh, if, especially if you have encountered problems with disease. And also, it's, it's an idea, if you do have a problem with it, that you have a, a kind of an emergency site. It doesn't have to be very big. It, just be, can be, it doesn't have to be the size of an apiary, just somewhere where you can move a colony if you're suspicious about it and you just want to put it there uh, and so you can have a good look or bring along somebody else to have a good look at it. Um, just somewhere, uh, as I said, it doesn't even have to be an apiary site and probably is only going to be a temporary site until you start it out if there truly is a problem with the colony. Swarms as well, uh, you know, and swarms are beginning to fly. There's an awful lot more swarms around these days. Uh, you know, uh, it seems, and there is evidence that uh, swarms are, are sorry, uh, feral colonies uh, are beginning to, uh, are coping with Varroa much better um, and are surviving in the wild. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's much ch a good chance of getting a uh, swarm from the wild, which is good, is good because these would probably have uh, a natural resistance to Varroa, for instance. Uh, but you could also be getting a swarm from another beekeeper and you don't know what the hygienic factors of that beekeeper are, the, you know, what kind of disease problem they've ever had. So just, if you have a swarm, um, you don't know where it came from, then just treat it with a bit of suspicion. It's quite possible if it's a um, swarm from the wild, then it is probably uh, quite likely to be probably healthier than your own bees, you know, because there's de developed nat natural immunity. Um, but just treat it with caution. Um, and there's nothing wrong. I mean, I would put out bait hives um, and I'd catch uh, swarms. Uh, and I know where there's not a place where there is uh, columns in trees and buildings, and I've caught swarms from them. And generally I find, you know, they can be, they can be quite good. Sometimes they can be excellent and sometimes they can be not much good really, you know, but they, they can be very good. Uh, so, you know, so you just treat them with suspicion, you know. Uh, so initially when they arrive, 
Uh, and you know, you have your uh, bait hive, and generally in my in my bait hive, I would might put I might put an old one old brood comb, and I try not to have it very old, you know, something that's maybe a couple of years old. Um, and then the rest would be foundation, and I use a, a, a lure then as well. So it have foundation, and I would often use the old stale foundation that maybe you know is gone you know, is has to be replaced. But rather than replacing, what I do is I put it in the bait hive. And I find that uh, swarms are absolutely fantastic at uh, renewing wax and repairing wax. Uh, so if you have these, so you wouldn't put these, say, frames to be too stale, maybe, or something. It might be the wax might be a little bit oxidized in them. I wouldn't put them into a, a, a brood box uh, uh, of an ordinary colony because they just wouldn't uh, have the impetus really to uh, draw it out. But in the swarms, swarms will draw anything. If you give them any kind of uh, foundation they will draw it out so what I would do is I'd so I'd have the foundation and I wouldn't feed them you know uh, for three days this is standard practice um, so you'd leave them there and you wouldn't feed them for three days and then then after that you can feed them it just gives them a chance to get rid of anything that they're carrying with them um, and less likely that they'll be feeding it to, to brood uh, now there's a thing like you know you can also be a bit more uh, extreme and this is practice and I think it's Switzerland and in Germany in areas uh, and what if you get a swarm what you do is you just put it in say your box and you put it in the dark you don't um, and you leave it there for two to three days obviously plenty of ventilation and, and that means then they have no opportunity, opportunity to forage so they have uh, they have no choice but to use up all the um, Honey that they're carrying in, in their honey sacks, and uh, you know, it means that they hopefully get rid of anything. In, in some cases, what they do is they just put them on strips, um, and then they would take the um, shake off the bees from the strips and destroy whatever wax they have been produced by the bees, and then they would hive them and clean, um, hive and feed them well. And again, you know, if you're getting uh, if you're getting a swarm from somewhere and you're not too sure, just find maybe put it somewhere. Uh, safe away from your other hives and leave it there and examine it, you know, and you know fairly, you should know fairly quickly once if it's a laying queen that's in it, uh, you know, they will be producing brood fairly quickly. So you can examine the brood, see if there's any problem with it. And uh, so, yeah, so this is a common, I won't, you know, deal with this too much, but it is, you know, it is a very big thing at the moment. So, um, you know, there is, disease resistance, there is a genetic component. Some bees are just naturally more resistant to disease than others. And this is quite obvious, say something like chalk brood, which seems to be, um, some bees seem to be inherently susceptible to chalk brood. Um, so there is this, so what you want to do is breed from bees that have this natural disease resistance. So, you know, as I said before, always include observations and disease in your hive record. So when you're going back, and you are deciding to breed, you would find out which ones you know have, uh, have been susceptible to any kind of a disease. Um, you know, you would record varroa load. So you could then is when you could be picking ones that consistently have very low varroa loads, and you could include those in your breeding program. Uh, and you can do a study of hygiene behavior, a little bit laborious, but it is, you know, it's, if you have the time, it's a worthwhile study where you can actually um, study, assess the hygienic behavior of different colonies using different methods. And there's loads of information uh, on, on this in the, um, uh, on the internet, loads of studies being done and, you know, and a lot of simple tests for um, various methods of hygienic behavior, you know, displayed by bees. So then you would you would breed from the ones that are more resistant or more tolerant to disease, um, and and I say there's a lot of this is ongoing at the moment and a lot of quite a lot of success as well. You know a lot of beekeepers now have had uh, colonies that they haven't uh, treated for several years. I have actually inherited uh, from a friend of mine who died. I inherited an apiary now, and this is seven years now. This is this summer will be seven years since they've last been treated. Uh, for Varroa and they're, they're thriving. There's no problem with them whatsoever and I'm uh, continuing monitoring them. So obviously if you, you know, in your records, then you will know which colonies have 
uh, suffer disease and then you would actually make a point of not breathing from then no matter what the other traits are uh, you know if it's a very docile uh, colony but it's very susceptible to um, you know chalk brood or, or seems to always have high row loads then you know you wouldn't pick that as a breeding colony and then you know colonies that have you know so obvious signs of susceptibility you should really destroy them just this is just almost like a form of natural selection so say especially if i have colony uh, with severe chalk brood and it hasn't actually happened that often but occasionally i'll call the queen because it probably is a genetic trait where it's consistently uh, high levels of chalk brood this is said this is uh, so chalk brood like you know um so you would monitor that and and you would uh, you know some some it's quite obvious from your records that some are susceptible and some aren't uh so i may just talk a bit now so i'm going to go on now to kind of a bit more practical issues on cleaning and sterilizing uh, your equipment um and so just maybe even reusing equipment so you should really regularly to commission decommission high parts so your brood box your floor take them out and clean them and sterilize them uh, you know um, and what i i actually have a system where i every year i use a different color i use five different colors uh, on, that i paint my uh, i use um fence life um, and i've paint my i use wooden hives and i paint them this color so I know, so this year it's, uh, it's kind of a, it's dark brown color. So all the, all the brood boxes that are dark brown, I know have been there now for five years. And so, so I would take all those brood boxes out and replace them, you know, with clean ones that I've cleaned and are ready to go. Um, and, and that would also include uh, the um, floors and the crown boards um, and any other, you know, Piece of equipment and uh, so i would take them all out clean them and repaint them this year dark brown again so i know then how long they have been in service uh also when you you know when you take your equipment if you were there and you're uh replacing your brood box before you clean it uh make sure it's worth your while uh, beekeepers are a fright for holding on to equipment they are uh, the beekeepers are the worst hoarders probably of any any occupation uh, but just you know, have a look at it and make sure is it worth your while replacing it. I mean, you you know, you should be thinking, you know, am I going to have my colony living in that again for another five years, or would it be just as well to um, use it for kindling? Um, and you know, you know, uh, I mean, so a lot of beekeepers make their own equipment, but even equip equipment is is actually quite cheap these days compared to what it was, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago as things go. Um, so you know, it's don't be holding on to stuff. Um, it's false value to be holding on to things too longer than they, they need to be. Of course, if you look after as well, it will have a longer lifetime too. So when you have your equipment, say a brood box, for instance, you would remove all comb, propolis, and other debris in there with a good good uh, scraper. Uh, you can get all kinds of uh, uh, good you know scrapers that. Um, uh, you know, the well, painter and decorators use all kinds of shapes and sizes, and they're very good at removing this. So you wash it thoroughly. I, I'll get onto this now in a while, but you know, you wash it thoroughly, and then you'd sterilize. So just make sure washing and sterilizing are two different operations. Washing just removes uh, the obvious dirt, uh, whereas sterilization where it gets rid of um, all the unseen infectious agents, particularly. AFB. It's, you know, I wouldn't regard anything as sterile unless any potential, you know, you know, I've never had problem with AFB, touch wood, but, um, you know, I would always imagine that it is there. So I'd sterilize such that it would remove the AFB if it was there. And that obviously would, would remove anything else also. And then I would repaint it. And uh, then any, you know, the dark, any dark comb scrapings, old wooden parts, uh, I, I would burn, um, you know, it's great kindling, but obviously keep them, keep them where bees can't get at them. Yeah, just burn them, you know, as you would, um, 
as you would say an AFB infected hive. Uh, now, you know, there is probably legal impediments about burning uh, equipment. And if you technically you're supposed to actually apply for a license to burn anything, but I mean, you know, this is in, in interest of animal safety. So I have no qualms about it. And it isn't, it isn't a lot. It's, a, you know, you do it maybe once a year. So I'm just, just going to talk about cleaning agents, cleaning and sterilize agents. And I just want to give a myself with a warning you know when you're using chemicals always read the labels use the appropriate protection you know it varies different different from one to the other and, and follow the precautions and don't mix different chemicals because you know they can some chemicals by themselves can be quite harmless but when mixed together it can have uh, can be be much more hazardous so I'm just going to go through the different uh, methods of cleaning and sterilizing. The first one, which isn't a chemical, obviously, but the it's standard method used uh, is the blowtorch or anything that uses, you know, a, a lit gas flame to uh, torch the parts of the hive. So the one thing you need to know is that you still have to scrape the surfaces because, you know, if you blowtorch without scraping first, you're just melting your propolis. Um, wax or whatever onto, onto whatever is underneath. So you still have to scrape everything. Uh, now there is, you now this is, the blowtorch are, has been the standard method of sterilizing equipment for years and years, but um, there has been a um, research a study done in New Zealand where they showed that um, 20 minutes of sterilization with a flame, with a blowtorch flame, <clears throat> probably but does not necessarily kill AFB spores. So, which is an interesting, like, you know, uh, thing to be aware of. Uh, another uh, issue, and I always use um, blowtorch for years, but you do find after a couple of years that when you're on your second or third go of, of sterilizing a piece of equipment, you know, uh, and, and you want to give it a good, your, the advice is to go very deep with it. Uh, you know, you are actually damaging the parts, you know, um, depending on what type of, type of wood it is, obviously, if it's deal, especially with deal, cedar, not so much, but deal, I find that it, it damages very quickly. Uh, and obviously you can sterilize polystyrene or plastic components uh, with a flame. Uh, but it can be, you know, it can be part, still part of the whole procedure. So this is yeah. Just, so this is obviously a high-powered um, torch, and with this you can actually do it quite quickly. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is washing soda, and uh, so washing soda is um, sodium carbonate, uh, and you can get this in any supermarket. Usually, most supermarkets. It's very very cheap, uh, and it's uh, it's a brilliant, absolutely fantastic agent for cleaning cleaning agent it doesn't sterilize this is important to know it's not a sterilizing agent because it's a very good cleaning agent so you use it in a 10 percent solution uh, it come, usually comes in 500 gram or kilo, one kilo bags and you use it in a 10 percent solution so uh, so when you use this cold this is ideal for in your bucket for cleaning your gloves in the hive tool in the apiary uh, and you would make that up and you would have a scrubber i've used steel wool inside and then you know between each hive as I said before you would um wash it with the washing soda uh, and if you use it war use it warm uh, it's very good for cleaning you know uh hive parts aren't, aren't too dirty you know it'll, it'll remove a certain amount of propolis but not it won't go if there's a lot there it won't go into it if, if there's you know a couple of years worth of propolis and it's unlikely to remove it but when you're hot, you use it very hot, it's brilliant for cleaning frames, piling up, if you boil it up, uh, you can throw frames into it, plastic clean excluders, mini nukes, you can have spotless with it, and uh, just uh, heat up the whole lot together in a tank. Uh, now washing, as I said before, washing soda is quite mild, but it's still basic, it's a basic, you know, uh, rather than, you know, rather than an acid, it's a base, uh, which is still, um, you know, it's, it's still kind of effect. So just be careful, especially when it's hot, you know, that you have the usual protective equipment. Uh, clean your bee suits. When I'm doing my load of bee suits, I just throw in, I throw in the crystals in along with uh, the washing powder, and it seems to give that just a little bit of extra um, 
uh, you know, strength to, to the cleaning. Um, or if you need to soak a piece of this, you can actually, you know, make up a solution of this and, and, and uh, soak it first of all before you put it in the washing machine. So this is, yeah, this is just a tank there for cleaning the frames. You boil up the frames, it doesn't take long. Um, you boil them up and then you probably still need to give the frames a quick scrape or a scrub afterwards because the propolis becomes kind of, um, uh, it comes soft, which is becomes, uh, there's actually kind of a compound form between the, uh, the carbon, kind of a carbonate compound. So you kind of need to still do is give it a scrub and then maybe and hose the whole thing down. Now, caustic soda is another one, and I've just put, you know, this is, this is uh, quite dangerous. Uh, sodium hydroxide, this chemical name. Um, this is highly corrosive. Uh, now, some beekeepers I know use this in hot solutions, clean frames and high parts. And uh, I, I personally would not recommend it. I worked in a, a chemical plant where uh, caustic soda was used uh, fairly strong. It was fairly strong, high temperature caustic soda, and it's uh, deadly dangerous. Um, it's uh, one problem with uh, is because it's a base, what happens if you do get a splash of caustic soda, it won't burn you straight away because it kind of forms kind of a soap on your skin uh, and so it can actually take a while before uh, you realize it's causing any damage you know so i would i would actively recommend not using this as well like it will actually it'll rust any metal parts that you have there if you have nails inside in the frames it will rust them uh, very quickly uh, but however cold solution is very good for removing propolis, so a 10% solution, uh, especially for polystyrene. Now, this is how I'd recommend you, uh, cleaning polystyrene of propolis. Uh, so you have 10% solution of sodium hydroxide, and you don't actually have to make it up yourself because if you can get oven and grill cleaner, now often it's actually potassium hydroxide rather than sodium hydroxide, and it has a obviously has a nozzle, a spray nozzle, and this works really well. Even Mr. Muscle, actually works quite well. It's, it's based again on the same thing. It has a surfactant in it, which kind of makes it just a bit messy at sometimes because it foams. But if you go to some uh, DIY places, they will have this available, you know, high powered or say they would use it for uh, cleaning uh, large um, kitchens, large ovens in kitchens and restaurants and that it's used. And it's available like often, often K, as KOH as 10% solution. And it's, you know, you would just um, spray this on where the propolis is, leave it for about five minutes, and then a bit of elbow grease and a bit of more water on it, and then you might have just a little bit, and this works very well also. Bleach is another one. This is a really a very good chemical, and again, you have to be careful though. Uh, but generally, what you're using it in very, very, um, very dilute, um, solution. So bleach is basically sodium hypochlorite, um, often known as hypo. Uh, it's used an awful lot in, in industry, agriculture, uh, various things for cleaning. So in household be bleach that you would get for cleaning your toilets, whatever, as about around three to five percent hypo, and it also usually contains a surfactant just to give it that kind of uh, soapiness um, uh, to make it uh, react with, with dirt. But you can get it in uh, agricultural bleach. Uh, you can get it in places to sell agricultural goods around 10 to 12% hypo. And this is actually very good value. You can get uh, 25 liters, um, I get 25 liters um, of 11% hypo at my local agriculture store for about 25 euro. Um, and, you, and what makes that even, it, it, it's, it's always, I'll come back to that, but it's, um, it's a very good cleaning agent, but always never heat it up because this is it's a solution of chlorine. So basically, uh, you know, when you heat it up, you're releasing the chlorine. It, it's good cl cleaning agent. Um, say if you have if you have a small number of frames and you don't want to boil them up, uh, you can actually soak them in um, bleach, a, dil a very dilute solution of bleach for say 24 hours, and it'll actually soften all the propolis on it. <coughs> Or you could, if you had apodeas or polystyrene parts, you could soak them in this overnight, and 
it will uh, soften any propolis, uh, but always use it cold. Now for, for sterilizing, and um, it's excellent to sterilizing. It is the only thing uh, that kills AFB spores for certain. So you use it in a 0.5% solution. Right? So when you're buying, so I say in there, I bought by 25 liters of 11%. So that's the equivalent of 22 times that of 0.5% solution. Uh, so basically soak, you soak whatever, if you've cleaned your brood box and you soak it uh, for 20 minutes in 0.5% uh, hypo, uh, just to be, and it will sterilize it and then just give it a rinse with water. Now, the only thing is it, it does go off, it contains chlorine, so the chlorine will naturally evaporate from it. So when you make up a batch, uh, I've tried, I've looked in trying to look on the um, internet to find information on how long it actually lasts, you know, the kind of half-life of it, and I can't get any information, but, uh, you know, I tend to make maybe, uh, you know, if I was using it, for sterilizing, um, I would you know make it up to maybe one percent, and I take that to last me maybe forty eight hours. I think. But always, you know, keep it in a sealed container. Um, but you know, it's as I said, it's quite cheap. Uh, right. Um, sorry, I'll just go back to that as well. So when you're using it for cleaning as well as sterilizing, I would use zero point five percent as well, or you know, zero point five to one percent solution. Really more than enough when you're, uh, say, using as cleaning agent, say to, um, you know, if you're, say, as I said, if you have your frames that you want to soak overnight or, um, you know, to get rid of the propolis, 0.5 to 1%. Uh, acetic acid is another one. Uh, it's, this is um, ethanoic acid, I'm sure the correct name. Uh, this can be available as glacial or 80% solution. It not, it's not used as much uh, as it used to be. It's used for fumigating brood combs. But then you see, you should really get rid of any, you should, uh, most of your brood frames that you take off, you should be getting rid of anyway. Uh, so you're only really using it for ones that are only slightly used uh, combs that you're taking out. Um, and you wouldn't normally be taking those out of the hive um, unless, you know, there's some problem with the hive, and if there's some problem with the hive, then you're probably better off getting rid of them. Uh, but yeah, if, if you are using it, uh, just, um, it can also use for, for, for to treat super combs. Uh, it's, it's effective against uh, wax moss and nosema and chocolate spores, and, you know, it's said that's possibly EFB as well. I can't get confirmation on that. Um, but um, and uh, but you need temperatures of greater than fifteen degrees for the uh, acetic acid to evaporate. Um, often guys do it in say in a greenhouse in a polytunnel and it works well there. Uh, just because it gives a fair, the, even though it's not a strong acid, the fumes can give you quite a hit um, if, if you come up, you know, if you sniff them unexpectedly. Uh, and this is you'd stack the box say this is a brood box being treated and you'd uh, have a saucer or a sponge probably is better and you put it on you have an eek and then you would cover that with the crown board and wrap the whole thing up and maybe in black plastic um and i think i, I can't remember it's you know as i said it's not used as often but a, but a week should be sufficient to do that you know uh, but as i said it's not used as often as it used previously Sorry, uh, so that's basically about it, but there's loads of information out there on these, these different uh, aspects of um, disease prevention. Uh, the um, UK Food and Environment Research Agency have, uh, and uh, the National Bee Unit have a fantastic range of advisory leaflets that are free to download, uh, covering every aspect of disease. These are absolutely excellent. Uh, John McMullen's book, I think, has a great section on Principles of Disease Prevention. And I would also advise reading uh, research by um, Tom Seeley on his, uh, say, research he's done comparing uh, wild and managed colonies, or where he's actually uh, treated some colonies um, as if they were wild and kind of had them spaced apart and had them in small cavities 
and this and uh, you know I think I think there's actually that talk might be available on the available on the NIBS website, but it's very fascinating. Um, and uh, there's also this uh, very good, uh, quite hard to go get. I got a, uh, somebody gave me a photocopy of it. It's a New Zealand paper, and it's about uh, it's, you know it's just a lot of these principles are uh, covered as well in, in this uh, paper. So I think that's about it. I probably obviously haven't covered everything, but I hope I've just kind of uh, given a quick review anyway of the different uh, you know principles of, of uh, you know. Uh, disease prevention in the East. Um, uh, okay. Thanks, Owen. That was very thorough. <laughs> uh, I just wonder do many people have questions? Um, so, somebody asked in the chat comb renewal, we can do. How do we do colony dispersal? Not quite sure what that refers to. Yeah, he's talking about the April layout, like. And, oh, okay, yeah. And so, I mean, and I said, I kind of said that it's quite difficult, a practical sense, to do that uh, as a beekeeper because you know there's only a limited amount of um, of area you have for your apiary, and obviously, if you're spreading them out much far, further, uh, you know, it's going to make it's going to be a logistical nightmare. Uh, my point being is just basically don't. And in this country, we, we we don't really like, but if you go to some countries, uh, they put their hives really, line them up really, really close together on top of each other with the entrances only, you know, even, in, even only inches apart from each other. So, you know, um, just depending, make best use of the space you have, like, you know, and spread them out and, and try and organize your um, apiary in a kind of a, Ergonomic, I suppose is the word, ergonomic fashion that uh, the other colonies are spread as far as possible. Um, let's see if there's another. Yeah, there's a question in the QA. Is there any cleaning agent that less that is less damaging on the wooden hives? Well, less damage. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, at the bleach, bleach is, has has little effect in the wooden hives. There's no effect whatsoever, really, in my experience. Uh, you know, the zero point five percent solution of hypo uh, has no has no effect on, on, on wooden hives. I've never experienced any problem. Uh, one, I don't understand. Uh, oh, okay. Um, Philomena McKenna asked uh, two questions. Oh, yeah. One observation of bee hygiene method. I, I don't understand what, what that is. Well, I saw one there how to count the chalk brood. Was it how to? Yeah. Yeah. So I, this is just, this is just a personal thing. So I just basically um, devised over the years. Just, and I just, it's no point trying to work out anything that's time consuming to work out what percentage. Uh, you know, of colony of uh, cells of chalkwood, but I just so basically, you know, uh, severe, medium, and mild. So mild was, is is just a few, a few you come across and you're doing and you notice a few uh, cells with chalkwood in them. Medium is, you know, and it's it's just it's a subjective thing, uh, and you get a hang of it after a while. So medium is then when there's a, a bit more it's severe. Then is as it says is when there's quite a lot, quite a proportion of uh, cells, you know, you know, 20% more with, with chalk root. That's severe. Um, are you looking at the, the chat says, is yeah. it recommended to sterilize each wooden hive once every five years or sooner? Now, this is my, I just said, this is my practice and each beekeeper has to develop their own methodology for, uh, you know, hygiene. It's up, it's, entirely uh, and you know I wouldn't I don't recommend this works for me uh, I don't think it's worthwhile doing it more often and some beekeepers might leave it go a bit longer um, it, but you know if I was there and I noticed one particular brood box is getting a bit grubby or there's something wrong with it I would take it out even though it might only be a couple of years um, it's it's up to yourself to come up with what you think works for you but it's a good idea to have a system you know where you know, you logically know that this brood box is due to be, you know, come out 
you know to be cleaned this year and replaced um and it just makes it easier for you to do it if you have a system uh you know, telling you to do it um okay so how do you clean your smoker properly going from colony to colony yeah this everybody seems to have a problem with this like um i so i have my bucket and i have my hive i have hive tools in my bucket and i have my gloves and then my scrubber and i just uh wash uh, you know as i said i have hive tools i have probably four or five hive tools inside the book soaking there already um and i just scrub those and i get my hive tool and just and it's the bellows like i'm not talking about dipping the lit smoker in there is the, the problem is you're handling it in the bellows so and there's often a build up of propolis in the bellows so if you can just roughly just roughly with the scrubber it doesn't have to be in depth but if you do it every time there's going to be no build up of propolis on on the on the smoker should bait hives be filled with foundation or just a few yeah this is and i the thing is i've seen some um bait hives by other by some beekeepers and often they only have a few hives in them and the problem is uh, sorry a few frames in them because obviously if you put in say uh, 11 frames of foundation into your bait hive that's 11 frames of foundation you don't have to put into another hive and you're you mightn't get a swarm so um but if you put only three of those hives in and you leave the rest blank then uh, it's quite possible that the swarm arrives and if the weather is really good in a couple of days they can have that full of wild comb in there and it's a uh, real mess this is why i use as i said because you know i would have a lot of come across a lot of stale uh, frames you know that i've come you know i'll be there and the foundation I made up last year that didn't get used or for one reason or the other or it might be a couple of frames that got bent or uh, foundation that got bent or whatever and i stick these in because it doesn't matter they w i won't be using them anyway um what you could do is see the thing is you know um you want your bait hive to be a certain size. At least, I think 40 liters is the size, which is about the size of a national box. Uh, but what you could do is you could put a dummy board in there, uh, or two dummy boards even. You want to, so that the bees, so, you know, uh, or even a couple of tin dummy boards, so it won't affect the bees' perception of the size of the box, but you're not using your, all your foundation. But you need to fill up your box. Point I'm making. Uh, so back in the chat, there's a couple of things. Um, the sugar shake, can you explain the process and what benefits it has? Um, yeah, so the sugar, I won't go into too much detail because you look, uh, if you go onto the NIBS website, I think there is a, an explanation of it. So basically what you do is you measure out a certain number of bees. You cover them with uh, icing sugar uh, and you shake them uh, in this container. This container has a mesh lid. And basically what happens is you shake them with the icing, it rubs any varroa that are on them, you rub them off. Then what you do is you shake that, say you might have a basin of water and you would shake that gently over uh, the basin of water and any of the dislodged varroa will come out. So say you would measure, say, for example, if you measured 100 bees and you're there and you shook it, gently shook it and you looked at the basin and you saw four five say four varroa that means then you have an infestation rate of four percent that means that four percent of the adult bees have a varroa on them now it doesn't give you any indication of um what the varroa load is in the brood uh, and it will depend and obviously if there's less brood there'll be more on the um, on the more varroa on the adults when there's less brood in, in, in the colony. Um, but it'll give you a, a very good, accurate, fairly accurate indication. And, and there's a lot of this in the internet as well, where you can actually throw in a kind of a conversion factor to give you a kind of a, an idea, depending on how much brood you have. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the best way, you know, the, the other method that is probably the most accurate is the, um, what you call it, where the, the, the alcohol uh, rub, where they actually put the bees into, say, whatever, a few hundred bees into um, some alcohol, ethyl alcohol, and 
basically shake them and all the row comes off, but you're killing your bees. So this is, you know, if you don't want to, to do that, you know. Uh, and it's quite it's quite accurate, you know. Um, let's see. Is the brittleness of the wax on a frame indicative of how old or close to replacement it is? The brittleness of the wax in the frame, as in, is in drawn drawn comb. I would, uh, I would imagine it's. Oh, I don't yeah, know. like drawn comb won't be will be become almost like hard plastic. It's you know it's not particularly brittle. Uh, it just gets covered, you know, with, it gets embedded with um, propolis and, you know, old pollen and old cocoons uh, and everything, and it becomes more, you know, I, I suppose it is probably, in a way, it is a bit brittle, but it's tough. It's a tough material. If you're talking about just foundation, uh, you know, the brittleness of foundation, foundation as it gets old, uh, oxidizing a uh, layer of oxidation will build up on the outside of it um, and that uh, causes it to become more brittle. You can actually, just a, while I'm on the subject, you can actually, if you have frames of foundation that are uh, seem to be getting a bit stale, just a hair dryer, gently hit them with a hair dryer um, and that will uh, you know, melt the layer of oxidation on them uh, and cause the you know the wax to come through, and it can make it easier for the bees to, to draw out. Um, should you wait until first inspection to clear solid floors of debris? Solid floors. Um, well, solid floors. Yeah, yeah. Well, generally, yeah. And traditionally, I mean, I haven't used a solid floor really for. 20, more than 20 years, uh, but it was always the first job you did, the first inspection you did, as you always had your uh, a clean solid floor, and then you take out, uh, you take the lift the brood box off onto the clean one, and you took out the old one, which used to be absolutely not really manky. If anyone remember, that's the weird thing about the open mesh floors; it keeps them nice and clean. Um, so if you have uh, you know, you could, you could actually do it. You could actually, without opening the brood box, you can actually, if you think, uh, you think, because there will, a lot of gunk will build up on the, on, on, on the solid floor. Um, and if you have a narrow entrance, it can actually cause a bit of blocking also. Uh, so you don't actually, be, you don't have to be doing an inspection. If you, you know, you just have to gently, say if you had a clean floor there and gently took off the, lift the whole brood box, don't take off the ground board and just put it onto the, onto the new one. You can do it without waiting for the first inspection if you think it needs to. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. When taking out the observation board to clean it, what's the best method of cleaning it? That's the insert underneath the... I presume, yeah. Yeah, the best method, well, again, depends how dirty it is. Um, so uh, over the winter, it can, uh, like, it can accumulate quite a lot of cappings on it. Um, I would generally, uh, you know, scrape it, just scrape it into your uh, that container, say your container for your scrapings, for your brace comb, your, uh, all your bits and pieces, uh, scrape it in there. I generally take them off then, I take them off then, then generally about maybe May when the weather starts improving. I prefer to take them out and I bring them home then and wash the whole lot um, just with a, power hose um, and then put them all back in for the winter because I like, I think they're kind of, it's good. As I said before, bees have no problem dealing with the cold, but uh, wind can be a bit of a factor. So I find that it just acts as a kind of a draft excluder underneath the hive. Um, so I, I leave them in, in, the, in the hive um, all winter. Uh, even though, you know, there's, there's, there's a bit of a gap um, between the floor and insert uh, anyway, but uh, it just provides a little bit of a, you know, uh, um, blocks a bit of the direct wind anyway. If you put your frames in the freezer, will this kill all diseases? No. Uh, and I don't know what it will. I, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know what it will kill, but it won't kill AFB, won't kill EFB, probably wouldn't kill Nozema. Uh, it would kill wax moths. I think that's all. Uh, that's maybe the maybe chopper. Uh, chocolate, I'm not sure of. There's, there isn't, the thing about chocolate is probably not as much known about chocolate as the others, and which is quite ironic because we tend to get quite a lot of chocolate in Ireland. Yeah. Um, 
So, uh, I, no, but I, I can't imagine it would. I can't imagine it would uh, keep a child for it. I just thought maybe since it's a fungus, it might. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't I have no idea to tell you the truth. Nor do I. I think that's the end of the questions, which is okay. So, um, great. Yeah. So I think thank you very much for your time, Owen. Problem. And uh, thank you everybody for coming along. And uh, let's see. Have we have some else? Anybody else? No, they're just thank yous, which is which is good. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Owen. And I'll Thanks a million, Brendan. Okay. Talk to you. Bye. Take care.